Hey, campfire crew, let's get it on. Stalked After Ballroom Dance Classes by Idiot Eswich. I apologize if I have some errors. English is not my first language. For context, I am now 26, and I met my stalker around 14 or 15. When I was 14 years old, I decided to take ballroom dance classes. That was kind of normal for teenagers in my generation in my country. There you had to change partners each song, so every girl would dance with every boy. In my group that consisted of mostly teens between 14 and 17, there was a really tall, I mean almost two meters tall, 21-year-old guy, Philip. We had a nice chat the times we danced, but he seemed weird. And because I was young and naive, and that's how I normally made friends, I told him where I lived when he asked me. So the stalking began. At that time, I didn't realize that it was stalking. I just thought he had much time on his hands and that it was annoying. Philip would ride on his bike from his home, he lived one town over, over to my house and ask if I wanted to spend time outside with him and play. After doing that a few times, I asked my parents to tell him that I wasn't home when he would come over. Both my parents and I were very oblivious about his actions for a very, very long time. At one point, the stalking ended for a few weeks, and Philip also did not come to dance classes. At the time, I became part of a friend group of a boy I fancied. For some months, he had a girlfriend, but they split up after, and I became his girlfriend. Unfortunately, Philip was also friends with the best friend of my boyfriend, so he was also part of the group. They told me Philip was in a mental hospital. In the span of his stalking, Philip was in mental hospitals multiple times, and every time he was, I was glad because then I had some peace. When I was 16, my family and I had to move because our landlady had thrown us out. She wanted to live in the property herself. So we moved one town over. We started living two streets apart from my stalker, and every time Philip was out of the hospital, he would be at my house. It wasn't as often as before, but still. At my father's birthday, he rang again, and because my family had guests, they told me to open the door. And there he was, looming over me like a dark, menacing shadow man. I told him to leave, and I tried to close the door, but he blocked it. So I was standing there, afraid, begging him to leave. At one time, I even ran inside to get my dad to send him away, but my dad said, He's your friend, it's your problem. So I went back to the door, and I begged and pleaded, Philip, please leave. At one point, he was even kneeling and sitting in the doorway. It was almost two hours later that he finally left. And at that point, it was obvious for me. I mean, I finally realized what type of behavior was going on. He was a stalker, and he was fixated on me. The next day, I sat down with my parents and told them that I was afraid of Philip. And my dad also apologized to me for putting me in that situation and not helping me. The next time Philip came to my house, my dad was there and told him that I didn't want any contact with him, so he left. After a few more incidents like that, he stopped showing up at my door, and I thought I got rid of my stalker. But every time I started to live happily, starting to forget my fear of him, a letter, or an email, or a gift showed up, and would send me back into my fears. At 20, I was out of school, and to pass the year, I had to wait to start my job. I worked in a grade school in a voluntary after-school care club for grade schoolers. After a month or two, my mom woke me up in the morning and told me to get dressed because she had called the cops. Apparently, Philip was again every morning at our door and asked for me, and my parents didn't tell me so I wouldn't get scared again. Finally, after the cops told Phillips three times to leave and he ignored them, they arrested him and he screamed and screamed my name and that he was burning for me and that the cops heard him. My parents and I were standing in the kitchen listening. The situation was so absurd and so much for me that I started laughing hysterically. We filed a report at the police for stalking and trespassing, 
but the officer said that they couldn't do anything because he hadn't hurt me physically. We tried to get a restraining order, but it didn't go through. A week later, Philip had sneaked into our garden, and like in a movie, he threw rocks at my window. Okay, throwing rocks at a girl's window is not romantic. It's creepy. Idiot me opened the window, but did not see anything until it clicked, and I ran downstairs and told my dad that my stalker was in the garden. Philip escaped. A week after that, I was in the kitchen cooking when Philip rang the doorbell again, and because we had no way of seeing who was at the door, I opened it. And there he was again, telling me that he missed me, and was saying that he had peeked through the blinds in the windows of the living room the past week to see if I was there. My parents weren't home. If they had been, I would have run, but like this, I had to swallow my fear and stand in the doorway listening to Philip talk until my boyfriend, a different boyfriend at this point, came over. I had sent him an SOS SMS, and he was on his way. After my boyfriend arrived, he told Philip to leave, and he did. Philip mentioned in passing that he now also had a girlfriend. After that, I didn't see Philip again for a long time. A friend told me he was taken by the men in white coats because he had believed that his mom was possessed by the devil. I was glad. It wasn't until two years later that I got a letter from court. I was to be a witness and told to attend in the case of the assault of Philip. Apparently after coming out of the mental hospital, he had a big fight with his girlfriend and hit her, and because she was scared, she played dead. Philip called an ambulance and the police finally had something against him. After the hearing, he was admitted again to a mental hospital, and I finally got a restraining order, and he was ordered to stay at least 30 meters away from our property. I was so glad. The restraining order also implied that if he broke any of the requirements, he would go to jail. So it was over. Two years ago, I also moved out of my parents' house, but I'm sharing this now only because I believe I'm seeing him again. But it can't be. He doesn't know where I live and he hasn't shown up at my parents' house. But I believe I have seen him when I leave the house. I just need reassurance that it's not him again, and that I'm safe at my home. Run-In with Drug Dealers, submitted by Patrick22. When I was in high school in the suburbs of a larger town out in the Midwest, I was a pretty decent football player, wide receiver to be exact. This has nothing to do with the story, but I also served as the team kicker for whatever reason. I had a good leg and was in track, so I guess that's why they picked me rather than having a full-time kicker. I was also a wrestler, and this happened between football and wrestling season. There was a guy on the football team who was two years older than me. I was a sophomore at the time. And for whatever reason, he didn't like me to begin with. Most of the guys on varsity were juniors and seniors, but there were a couple of sophomores like myself. This guy I'll call Bob would harass me all the time in practice, and was a lot bigger than me, so I just shut my mouth and took it. But the real trouble came towards the end of the season, when his girlfriend dumped him for me. I knew the trouble that I was bringing on myself if I started dating the girl, but she was a year older than me, she was super hot, and my loins couldn't say no. Of course, that didn't go well with him. Bob was more than pissed. He would seek me out in the hallways and try to start fights with me, and I kept telling him I wasn't going to fight because I didn't want to lose my wrestling season or get into any other kind of trouble. He would just call me a pussy and push me, but he never threw a punch. Friends between us told me how much he hated me and that he was planning on kicking my ass at some point and how they didn't want to get involved. They liked us both, and they told me that they kept trying to talk to him, but he was so pissed that his girlfriend dumped him. I was dead meat in his eyes. Ah, yes, the stupidity of youth. Get dumped by a girl and beat up the guy she starts dating. Like it's that guy's fault. Anyway, despite it being colder, I was at the outdoor track of the high school one evening, running to cut some weight and just stay in shape for wrestling season. I took wrestling a hell of a lot more seriously than I did football, and was planning on improving my record that year. The year before, I came in third in our regionals, and this year, a goal of mine was to win and go to states. So I was just out there as it was getting dark and thinking I needed to wrap up my run and get home for dinner, when I noticed a figure step onto the track about 200 meters away of the 400-meter track. 
whoever it was, just stood there. It was far enough away that I couldn't see who it was. Well, when I got to that end of the track where the gate to get to the parking lot was, it was clear to me that it was Bob. It was also clear that he was there for one reason, to fight me. I showed no fear as I got closer to him and stopped about ten feet away from him. He just looked at me and said, Okay, fag, this is it. No one else is around. No one else needs to know. Obviously, I knew what he was talking about, so I said, Look, man, I'm not going to fight you. He called me a pussy, and I said, Look, man, I know I can kick the living shit out of you, but that doesn't change anything. We could both get kicked off our teams. He was on the basketball team. I took a step to kind of move around him, but he moved in front of me again and said, Nope, we're doing this. At that end of the track where the parking lot was, was also the bus garage. Behind that was a dip that went down to a little ravine where a creek ran by our high school. It was usually a hangout for all the heads to smoke their weed and do their thing without prying eyes seeing them. Again, I tried to use reason with Bob, but there he was wanting to fight. That's when a car pulled up and three dudes I recognized as grads, like graduated from high school three or four years ago, got out of the car and started walking along the bus garage. I don't think they noticed us right away, but then I heard a noise behind me and turned slightly to see two other older guys I had never seen before coming up from the ravine. Had we known exactly what was going down, I'm sure Bob and I would have run before we finally did. But it took the two older guys finally noticing us after the other guys met up with them that we knew something was wrong. Without going into all the details, we were witnessing a pretty big drug deal for our town. We found out that later after telling some friends what had happened to us. As Bob and I stood there looking at them, one of the guys noticed that we were standing on the track and yelled over, the fuck are you looking at? The guy he was with said something to him that we couldn't hear. And then all five guys were looking at us. And even in the dark, I could see two of them take out knives. I said to Bob, you're going to have to put your fight on hold. He just said, yep. And we started to back up a little bit. There was no way we could go through the gate to get to the parking lot. And the woods at the far end of the track were a bad idea. The only outlet for me in my mind was the far side of the track. There was a fence there that led up to the baseball fields. Wide open fields. Nowhere to hide, but a good place to run. I certainly didn't want to mess with anyone with a knife, and I certainly didn't want to deal with a drugged out bunch of guys with knives. I whispered to Bob, We need to book it to the baseball fields. I don't think they'll be able to catch us. We started to turn, and we heard one of the guys yell out, Hey, assholes, get over here now! That was our cue to start running. And run we did. Even though Bob was bigger than me, he had his sprint shoes on that night. We hauled ass over to the other side of the track as the guys gave chase to us. We cleared the fence, got onto the baseball fields, and kept running. I turned around once to see the other guys getting over the fence, still chasing us. We kept running until we got up to the outside wall of the school and ran alongside that. I hadn't even thought of my car that I'd left back in the parking lot. And when I did, I thought, fuck it, I'll go back and get it later. Bob actually didn't live that far away and had walked over to fight me. Anyway, we got to the edge of the school and ran to the other parking lot that ran in front of the school. We came up short about halfway as we saw a car light staring right at us from the parking lot. It was the two older guys, the drug dealers. They stood there and one called out, You who, get your asses over here. I thought to myself, this is not good. Then I got a brilliant idea. I told Bob, hey, if you're looking for a fight, I think it's standing right in front of us. He kind of grunted and we both took off like rockets towards the two guys who I think were a little bit surprised we were running right at them. I took one guy and Bob took the other and we plowed right over them. They fell onto their asses and leather jackets and we kept running. As we were rolling along, I heard a loud bang from behind us and I swear that a bullet went right by my head. It was just this really strange whizzing sound. I can't say for sure. All we knew is that someone had fired off a shot and to this day I believe that a bullet or something went right by my head. 
Bob and I kept running to the street that led to our school. We crossed over it, almost getting hit by two cars. We jumped another fence and started running willy-nilly through Bob's neighborhood. He said to cut over here to get to his house. I followed him, and we finally burst through his back door, and he led me down to the basement. His mom called out, Bob, is that you? And he said, yeah, Mom, I'm just down here with a friend. Oh, I guess we were friends at that point. We collapsed into two chairs, not saying a word, just breathing heavily. Then we were just staring at each other, and I piped up, Holy shit, man, did that guy shoot at us? Big Bob nodded his head. We didn't say a word for another few minutes, and I asked, Should we tell somebody about this? He said, I don't know, should we? And I shook my head. Those guys probably couldn't have recognized us, and I certainly didn't want any more trouble. Neither did Bob. I looked at him again and said, you still want to fight me? And a big smile came over his face and he said, no, man, no. We ended up talking for another hour or so, me blowing off dinner and his mom bringing pizza down to us. He kept saying how he should never even have been out there. Had he not stopped me, I probably would have just gotten to my car and gone home. And that's when I remembered my car and to call my parents to let them know where I was and that I was okay. Bob and I ended up becoming best friends after that. As a matter of fact, he convinced me to go to the college that he was going to when he graduated. We're still friends to this day. I was the best man in his wedding, and he was the best man in mine. Funny how a terrifying time can make enemies the best of friends. We still laugh about that night, even though one of us could have gotten shot. Two idiot guys who got unified by a larger group of idiot guys. I've been through lots of other things in my life, including time in the military, but that night still stands out as one of the scariest things that's happened to me. Thankfully, in the military, I was never shot at. The time at school was the only time. I don't recommend it. The Haunting at the Brewery by The Apothecarium About a decade back, I used to work at a brewery pub. It was set in a pretty big and old building from the early 1900s. I worked there for a couple of years, and most of the time it was pretty chill, but backbreaking at times. In my time working there, I had two experiences that I can only describe as supernatural. The first one, it was a particularly late night, and I was tasked with closing up the hangar and loading docks. Closing it up was making sure there wasn't anything obstructing where the trucks would park, stacking up any loose crates and turning the lights off and locking it all up. I was about done, so I turned off the lights, and as I was making my way to the door, a beer bottle came rolling towards me from the dark between the tall stacks of crates. It wasn't forceful or anything. It looked like someone gently placed it on the floor and then rolled it towards me. I didn't think too much of it, so I picked up the bottle and placed it inside a half-empty crate. I turned around, And as I started walking, another bottle came rolling from the same place. Then another one. Tired and thinking it was a co-worker trying to fuck with me, I shouted, Hey, all right, you got me. Come on, I gotta close it up. I expected to hear laughter or something. But instead, it was dead silent. I waited for a couple of minutes, then turned on my flashlight and started looking around the stacks of crates for what I thought would be a giggling co-worker. After searching each corner, I gave up. I was a little weirded out at this point, but I just picked up the two bottles from the ground and placed them in the same crate as the first one. I turned off my flashlight and shouted at the darkness, All right, I'm locking up. See you tomorrow. Just as I finished saying that, a crate full of bottles fell from one of the stacks and landed two feet from me. Glass shards and beer exploded everywhere. The next day I told my boss about it, and he said it was probably a rat. The thing is, those crates, when full, probably weigh about 20 pounds. How could a rat push it? Talking to my co-workers, they told me that they also experienced weird stuff during closing hours. My second experience happened again when I was closing the place. This time I was closing the pub. When closing the pub, the last thing you usually do is restock the walk-in freezer. The freezer is probably just as old as the building itself, and it sits underground, right beneath the bar. 
I was down there filling that enormous thing with kegs and crates. Being a very old freezer from a time when safety wasn't a big concern, the thing didn't open from the inside. No handle, nothing, just a flat, plain steel door. So I did what I always did when I had to go inside there. I put a keg securing the door open. I was halfway through my task when I heard the door slamming shut. I rushed towards the door, but it was locked shut. I started pounding on it, but the only other person there was my boss in the office, two floors above me, and probably with his door closed. I tried my phone, but since I was locked underground inside a steel and lead box, I had no service. I was only wearing jeans and a t-shirt, so things were getting chilly pretty quickly. My face was going numb and my hands were getting stiff. I made a blanket out of cardboard, but it was doing very little keeping the cold at bay. The only reason I didn't freeze to death was because I had a date with a regular, and she went there looking for me. She asked my boss where I was, and when he couldn't find me, he went to the basement and found me inside the freezer. I'd been in there for about 45 minutes when he found me, and I was starting to consider writing a letter to my parents and drinking myself to sleep. My boss installed a chain to keep the door open after that, but I refused to ever walk into that death trap again. The weirdest part, the keg I had holding the door open was at the other side of the room when I got out. It was a full steel keg, not something that would just slide away, let alone quietly. I stopped working there shortly after for unrelated reasons. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature you'd like to hear narrated on my podcast or this channel, email it to UncleJoshTrueScaryStories at gmail.com. I read them all. If you have a scary Valentine or relationship story, please send that to me as quickly as possible for a Valentine's Day special. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. And if you'd like to take your support even further, find me on Patreon. A link to that is in the description below. I'm also on social media. Find links below for that as well. Everyone, be excellent to each other. And until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.